So if you would, we'll start in John 7. That's verse 53, just that last verse there. So then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, verse 8, verse 2 now. And early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. I want you to bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your scripture. Thank you for the words that you've spoken to your servants and that they were faithful in writing them down. God, we thank you for your word. That It's amazing that through all the, the, the changes and all the years and all, all the people that were involved, that it, it's come to us, God, and that we can study and we can learn from and we can draw from it. God, we thank you for the miracle of scripture itself and how you preserved it and, and guided over it. Father, we pray that you would speak to us through these words this morning. We pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds. God, just please point out the things in our lives that we need to have addressed, God. And Holy Spirit, we just give you just access to, to speak to us and to work in us. And to, to mold us and shape us. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to go over a few historical events just to get an understanding of what's going on here. And first of all, adultery is a grievous sin, a grievous sin. It's, it's one of the most intense sins that we, we come across in Scripture. You know, and, and this morning, I'm not here to try to beat up everyone in this building. I'm not here to try to, to make anyone sound you know, like, like we're holier than, than each other. But it's, it, I just want to be accurate to what was going on in Scripture. You know, it's a grievous sin. You know, it's so significant that, that God includes it in one of the Ten Commandments. And you know, we're not supposed to commit adultery. You know, it's a capital offense in the Old Testament. You know, adultery robs God of his glory. You know, it's, it's an offense to God because it breaks one of the most important covenant relationships that there is. It's a severe breaching of that covenant that we've made with one another in God's sight. It's breaking that important covenant made before God. Another reason that our bodies are not our own. They don't belong to us. Our bodies are loan to us. You know, they're preserved actually for that other person that God might bring into your life. Our bodies do not belong to us alone. And for those of, us, for those of you that are married, your body belongs to your spouse. It's not your own. You know, adultery has many practical consequences on society. Many things that just immediately it affects. For one, it destroys families. It has negative implications on most obviously the children. It breaks up that family structure. It also rips away the fabric of, of society. The foundation of it, it just pulls it out from under it. It breaks that. You know, and just to define adultery, you know, first of all, it's, it, it's any sexuality outside of the bonds of marriage, outside of that covenant of marriage. It's, it, it's, it's what adultery is. You know, usually, a man and woman come together to be husband and wife, and any sex outside of that is adultery. In its most obvious form, it includes, you know, if you're married, having sex with someone that you're not married to. Uh, but aside from that, if you're single, you know, it, can, it, it can also include fornication, you know, which is having sex outside of the, of the bonds of marriage. It can also include that. So just because you're not married, this is still speaking to you this morning. In the Old Testament, it was a capital offense. If a woman committed adultery, she was to be stoned to death. That's harsh, right? Stoned to death. You're meaning that her accuser would be the first one to throw the stone at her. When everyone else around would grab a rock and would throw the stones at her until she was bloodied, beaten, and left for dead. That, that's what happened when, when, they, were, when they found someone who committed adultery. 
Now, the Mishnah, which is the Jewish law that was prevalent in Jesus' day, had a particular way of putting to death men that were found guilty of committing adultery. Do you want to know what they did? The men, they would bury them, first of all, in, in dung, up to at least above their knees. You know, put, uh, bury them in dung, and then what they would do is they would get a towel, and they would wrap it around the neck, and, and someone would grab each end of it and literally pull until the light was sucked out of them. And then they would let that person fall in that heap of dung. That's what they thought of, of adulterous men. That's, that, that was the normal pro process in the Mishnah for putting to death a man that committed adultery and leaving him dead in a pile of dung. It's pretty bad. You know, so severe that it was that in the Old Testament, if you committed adultery during your betrothal, that's, that's the one year period where you were committed to be married to someone. If you committed it during that period, you know, you were also put to death. And that's why we see in the beginning of Matthew, you know, Mary is found to be with, you know, to be pregnant, and Joseph is very afraid for her. He wants to, to hide her away secretly. What? Why? You know, for what reason? He wanted to preserve her life. You know, she was liable to be put to death for what, for what she had done. So he seeks to hide her, to put her away in secret, so she's not held guilty for that sin. You know, if a young girl went out and had sexual relations with a man, you know, if she committed adultery with a married man, or if a woman was betrothed to be married and she went out and committed adultery, they would kill the woman by stoning, but where would they kill her? There was a certain place that they would kill her if she was betrothed and committed adultery. It was in front of her father's house. Actually, on her father's doorstep, these are core details, right? They would bring her up to her father's doorstep, and in front of her father, and probably in front of her brothers, they would cast stones until she was left dead. And for what reason did they do it in front of her father's house? Because they viewed it as his responsibility. They viewed the father as the head of the household, and that, it, it, that, that was his daughter, and it's his obligation before God to govern and oversee and protect and make sure that she was not out committing adultery. So they put her on her father's doorstep and stone her right in front of the family. And they wanted to make sure she wasn't out committing adultery. She wasn't out breaking up families. It's harsh. It's heavy. You know, and it couldn't be more different in our day, could it? In lots of ways, in this culture, adultery has become a virtue in some ways. You know, it's, it's become kind of a form of expression or of liberation. In lots of ways, we have glorified it in some cases. As people try to find themselves and try to, to find love, or people falling out of love, things like that. So we, we view it completely different than at that time. And I tell these stories so that we have an understanding of how heavy the situation was when Jesus was confronted with it. So we just put ourselves a little bit more in the shoes of the people that were there at this time. And so the religious leaders that day, they know that they have a possibility of tripping up Jesus in this instance. Why do I say that? You know, it was one of the greatest issues they could deal with. It's an issue of prime importance. It's so big and important. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to catch a woman in adultery, in the very act of it, and put Jesus in a dilemma. And what's that dilemma? Well, the Jewish law says that she has to be held accountable for committing adultery and she needs to be put to death. At the same time, you know, they were living you know, in Rome and... Romans said that if you committed capital punishment, if the Jews committed capital punishment, they were going to be held trial as well. So it was a lose-lose situation. Either Jesus was going to break the Jewish law of Moses, or he was going to break the Roman law. He was held guilty either way, and he was going to lose popularity. He was going to, be, he was going to receive persecution for whatever answer he had. If he says, okay, let's, let's obey Old Testament law and put her to death, then the Romans we're going to come and arrest him and put him in jail and likely execute him for violating Roman law. And because at this time, Rome is overrunning Jewish law. You know, that's the prime law that, at this point. They're, 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 they're taking over. So the Jewish people are living under Roman rule. And if he says, I can't put her to death because of Roman law, then he's violating the law of Moses. And in so doing, he's violating... Deuteronomy 18, that says he's a false prophet. 
So he's ruining his entire reputation. So either die or you're a false prophet. That's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of dilemma they wanted to put him in purposely. They planned this out. It was, it was thought out. It was planned. And so they bring this woman to him. And I love the thing that Jesus does first. You know, what, what does he do first? First thing he does is ignore them. It's a pretty good place to start when we're dealing with legalism. You know, ignore it. He starts writing in the ground. You know, it, I could be wrong, but I think this is the only time we ever see Jesus write anything in, in Scripture. The only time he, he ever is recorded as writing something. It's at, at, this, at this point. And there's been a lot of speculation on what he wrote. You know, obviously we don't know exactly what it is that he wrote, but just a few suggestions that we might think about. One of them is, you know, what were the, the, the Ten Commandments written by? You know, the hand of God, right? The finger of God. You know, some people speculate that it's possible he was writing, you know, one of the Ten Commandments, that I shall not covet another man's wife. It's possible. And why would he write that? Well, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but to catch this woman in the act, they had to actually see the act. Now, what do you think these men were doing? Standing outside of this place, staring at this woman and this man caught in the act. I'm imagining they're probably coveting this, this, this girl. You know, we, we know how guys are. If they see something, they covet it. So it's possible he's pointing out, hey, guess what? You just coveted this. He's possibly, he's possibly pointing that out. I, I, we, we don't know. Another speculation is, is uh, Jeremiah 17, 13. This is the, the more traditional belief. and It says, those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. So some people speculate that he was writing this scripture out, that they had forsaken, you know, forsaken the Lord. And so what Jesus does is he tells them, you know, okay, fine, we will impose Old Testament law. So that's, that's his initial reaction. We're going to go ahead and, 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 and impose the Old Testament law. We're going to uphold it, and we'll put her to death. But there's a stipulation. Someone needs to step forward now and cast the first stone. You know, he's true to scripture here. It was demanded that in the Old Testament, if you brought an accusation before someone, then you had to be the first one to throw the stone. So he's being true to scripture. He's saying, you know, anyone here without sin, you step up first. And so he's possibly writing something, pointing out their sin, and then saying, those who are without sin, come and cast the first stone. And so if you wanted someone to be put to death, you brought the accusation, and you had to cast the first stone. And this is a very, very big deal. You had to be very careful before you brought any accusations. Because if you bring a false accusation, guess what? Then you could have the exact same thing happen to you as you were going to bring on them. So you would be stoned in turn if, it's, if it comes out as a false accusation. And so people, you, you didn't want to mess around with this. You had to be very serious and very sure that what you had is, is a legitimate case with, with the evidence. Otherwise, you were to be held trial for the same offense. You know, one thing I don't believe Jesus, Jesus is saying here is that you have to be perfect to bring judgment upon anyone. I don't think that's what he's saying here. You know, he's not saying you have to be perfect to point out sin in the life of another person. Why? Because if that were the case, none of us could ever help correct anyone else. You know, there are scriptures pointing out where the, you know, the church is to be the first one to judge itself. You know, that we do, you know, judgment starts in the house of God. And there is scripture that points out that we are, you know, to, to help correct and, you know, and judge each other, not in a condemning, you know, a condemning selfish kind of way, but in, in a loving way that helps build and helps set free. And so here they're judging this woman. And my guess is that they probably, at the very least, committed adultery in their own hearts. At the very least. There's possibly a lot of other things that they were immediately guilty for. But I think this is a good starting point. They're at least guilty of committing adultery in their own hearts. And second, you know, secondly, it's possible they have also committed the same act with possibly even the same woman. You know, he knows that these may have been men who were unfaithful to their wives as well. You know, they're self-righteous hypocrites. You know, lastly, it's possible that, that since this woman, you know, he'll, he'll say in a moment, Jesus will say in a moment, that she's the kind of person who was loose, had loose morals. You know, she, 
She, was the, she got around in the town. And it's very possible that some of these men had been with her. So in other words, if you want to put her to death, how many of you have already been with her? And these are just speculating. It's speculation, but I like to think that these are some of the, some of the cases that might have been at this point. So what we're told in this story is that after this, they begin to leave from the oldest to the youngest. Probably the oldest being the most aware of their own sin, down to the youngest, who are still a little bit more naive, and they're leaving at this point. Now there's a few problems that come up when we read this scenario. The first problem is that the woman should never have been brought to Jesus in the first place. And who should, they have, who should she have been brought to? No, actually, the Sanhedrin. That, that was the ruling, judging class you know, for, for Israel. The Sanhedrin was supposed to take these matters and judge them themselves. Jesus was, was a traveling teacher. Now, this was not his, his job, but they still bring him to him anyways. Now, the Sanhedrin should have been the one to see this case. The other thing that's glaringly missing, do you see anything else big time missing in this picture? Where's the guy? Yeah, we all lost that, right? Where's the guy? You know, the reason that, that I think there is no guy is because I think this is a clear setup. This is a planned out scenario. You know, in order to accuse someone, you had to have a few pieces of evidence. They had to be confirmed. One of those is that you needed strong witness from at least two witnesses that saw the couple actually in the very act. You know, at least two people had to have caught them in the act and positively identified who they were. Not an easy thing to do, right? Secondly, they were also liable that if you saw someone about to commit an act of sin, you were obligated by the law to point it out to them and try to stop it. So it's clear that they had completely ignored their moral obligation to do this part. It's, it's clear that there's some type of agenda here. It was a setup. You know, they're using this woman as a way to, to promote their own selfish gain and to try to trap Jesus. You know, what I think might have happened, and it sounds like a far fetch, but I think it's, I, I really think it's probably happened, is that they possibly found this guy who was married and said, look, you know, we know that there's this, there's this loose, this, this morally loose woman, and we need to catch her in the act to bring her to Jesus. And what we're going to do is we're going to strike a little deal with you. you, know, you can, you know, cheat on your wife, and we're going to, we're going to stay hush about it, we're going to let you off the case. You know, plus, you know, maybe give you a little bit of a little payback money here. And we're going to just, to, to let you off the hook and catch the woman in the act so we can use her for our own purposes. To try to catch Jesus in, in this dilemma. I think that's what happened. You know, and being a, a morally loose man probably took that bet. Said, you know, here, here's a chance for me to commit adultery. I'm off the hook. No one's going to know about it. And they get to help out some of these guys as well. So, so he, I think he took, took the deal and decided that he would let them catch him in the act in order to have this woman to, to bring this dilemma to Jesus. And so they grab this woman you know, directly after catching her in the act you know, to prove that she was caught in the act of adultery. They bring her straight to Jesus. And you know, it's a beautiful thing. What does Jesus say? You know, anyone who has not committed the same sin can begin the crucifixion. You know, if you want to, to put her to death, if you haven't committed the sin, you start first. You throw the first stone. You know, and after the men depart, there's only one person remaining, and that's him. And he's standing there with the convicted woman, just the two of them. You know, and instead of himself condemning her, instead of coming down harshly on her, he looks at her with compassion. And he forgives her sin. You know, but does this say that he lets her off the hook? Is, is he... You know, I think it's wrong if we look at this woman and saying she's just a victim. No, she's not. Yes, she was part of a setup. At the same time, she willfully went there. She had this reputation. She was willfully breaking up families, willfully you know, corrupting society. She was a part of it. She willfully did this. And Jesus isn't saying that she's off the hook. 
And what does he say there? He says, go and leave your life of sin. You know, don't sin anymore. He wants her to stop. He wants her to be healed. He wants her to be cleansed. He doesn't just say, this is all okay, you're a victim. He says, no, he's trying to heal her. He wants her to be free from her sin. And to say that this woman isn't guilty is to really miss a lot of the point of this story. You know, a lot of us might, might look at some of our circumstances and want, to, and want to think we're the victims as well. You know, blame it on the alcohol. Or blame it on you know, some other substance that, you know, we weren't in our right minds. Or it was a difficult time. I mean, you know, it, was, it, was, it was a time of depression. I wasn't thinking right. I was a victim. You know, some friends gave me this drug. And, you know, I wasn't really thinking clearly, and it clearly wasn't me. And some of us might be playing the victim card as well for some things that we've done. And, you know, the best thing is to just own up. You know, it, we were willfully part of these things still, even if some things have happened to us. We, we've still been willful in a lot of these things. So Jesus, he addresses her sin. And the question we're left with, you know, the, you know, the irony of this is that they bring this woman to Jesus to be judged. But what does Jesus do? He judges everyone. He doesn't just judge this woman. He judges the men. He judges every person that comes. <laughs> it's a judgment party. <laughs> but the, I think the question we're left with, though, is why could Jesus overlook the Old Testament law of Moses and let her get away with this sin? You know, what, 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 for what reason could he do that? Is he, you know, without breaking the law? What's his justification? Why, why can he do this? You know, the reason he can do it is because he himself was going to die for it. He was going to pay the penalty for this sin. You know, this sin was required to be paid for by death. That's why they were stoned to death. That's why they were put to death. You know, death had to come with this type of sin. And Jesus was not just dismissing it, saying, you know, it's okay, move on. You know, I, I have the authority to just do it. He himself was going to pay the penalty of death for her sin. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says that you know, God made him, you know, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know, Jesus himself became our sin. He himself paid that penalty of death for sin. You know, there was that exchange that happens on the cross. You know, you've heard it said, you know, Jesus died for your sin. But do we know the weight of that? That means that every time that we've told a lie, you know, every, you know, every bit of sexual immorality committed, every, every sin committed was paid for by death. Christ paid the penalty instead of us, just like we were his children. You know, and, and you all know the you know, the gospel message, you know, the story of salvation. That Jesus was God, you know, who came down, became a man. He lived a perfect life and he died. And he was murdered, not for anything that he had done, but for, you know, for me and you, for those of us who needed that penalty be paid. You know, then three days later, he arose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Right? And right now, he's interceding for us as his children. And it says that, once again, he's going to come back to the world, and he's going to judge the living and the dead. And Zechariah 14.4 tells us that you know, where Christ will come. And where is he going to come when he returns? It says he's going to descend on the Mount of Olives. Now it's an interesting, interesting fact. Why? Because the story of the woman is taking place on the Mount of Olives. The same place Jesus is going to come to judge the living and the dead. It's the same place that, he, that this woman's sin was exposed and all were judged. And she was cleansed. You 
And what she experienced here at the Mount of Olives is true and did happen. But it's a picture, it's a foreshadowing of what's going to happen to all of us who know Christ and who Christ knows. You know, we don't just look at this woman and think this doesn't relate to us. This is exactly what's going to happen to us. All of us have sinned. All of us are guilty, deserving of death, deserving of punishment. We all have a debt that we can't pay on our own. And it's, it might sound terrifying and scary, but in, in a bittersweet way, Christ has exposed your sin. It's exposed. He knows about it. He sees it. Nothing's hidden from him. And just like this woman here had her sin exposed, just like all the men, the accusers that came, had their sin exposed, Christ exposes all of our sin. He knows about it. It's not hidden. In a way, this is God's grace to us. The fact that it's exposed is God's grace. Why? Because he can then heal. He can then take the place for us. You know, he can take that sin and place it upon himself and place his righteousness upon you. And then you're able to go out and live a brand new life. I just love that image how it's the same place he's going to return. You know, this story is us. We are in that same place. I don't know whether you're one of the accusers or whether you're that woman who's exposed all are going to be judged. When Christ returns, all will be judged. But those who know him and those that he knows can't have their sins paid for. Can become new people. Can be made whole again. You know, and this morning, we're just going to take a few moments. You know, Rick can come up. Actually, the whole band is hop on up. But it's just a time of confession between you and God. You, know, you don't have to, you know, if you, if you feel inspired to tell someone near you, you you can, but you know, I'm not saying you have to go around and tell. But just take a minute as we sing this last song and just confess before God. Confess those things in your life. You know, they're already exposed to Him. He already knows about them. You know, they're, they're not hidden. Just take, take some, a little time to acknowledge them, to confess so that He can heal you. So that He can bring that healing and that change, that you can go out and sin no more. So that we don't continue in this in this cycle of sin. We're no longer trapped in it. Why don't you go ahead and stand? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you turned such a bad situation that these people meant for evil, and you turned it into good. What they meant for evil, Father, you turned around and turned it into good. And you set this woman free. God, for each one of us, God, we're, we're guilty. Father, we acknowledge our sin before you. Father, we need your salvation. We need Christ to pay the penalty for us. Because we're all deserving of death. And we just thank you again, God, that this, this story that could have been so dark so gruesome, turned into a story of grace and of hope and of beauty. God, that you can turn some of the darkest times and make them beautiful. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy.
looking forward to that day, amen. So dance with all your might, lift up your hands and clap for joy, for times of song of the Lamb. One day we're going to join the song of the Lamb. We'll oh, dance with all your might. Lift up your hands and clap for joy for the time drawn. Oh, it's coming. Hallelujah. When he will Thank you. 